This sicha is a sicha of Rosh Hashanah and Vav Tishrei. Vav Tishrei being the yard site of the Rebbe's mother, Rebbe Tzinchana. And the sicha, as we we're going to see, is very much connected to Chana, the mother of Shmuel, the Haftoira about Chana. So the Rebbe starts off the sicha by saying that in the Haftoira of the first day of Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of Sefer Shmuel, it tells us the story about Chana, the wife of Elkana, and the general idea of the Haftoira is how originally Elkana and Yiladim, she doesn't have any children, and then as a result of her tefillah, while she was in the Mishkan and Shiloi, she was Nifkad. She was remembered by Hashem to have a child. She conceived. She became pregnant. She had eventually Shmuel Hanovi. The point of reading the Haftoira on Yom Tif, like in all Haftoiras, is like the idea of Kriyas HaToira, which Torah, of course, is Milosh and Hoira. It's coming to teach us a lesson, a directive, that a Yid should learn a Hoira in, the of the, of, of, in, the, in his Avoida in regards to that Shabbos or that Yom Tif. Says the Rebbe, the same thing is true in our case. Even though the reason we read the Haftoira on Rosh Hashanah is because Chana was Nifkan, she was remembered on Rosh Hashanah. However, the Haftoira contains many Hoirois in the Avoida of Yid on Rosh Hashanah and also many Hoirois generally. And since the Avoida that brought to Chana becoming pregnant, was the, the main, which is the main idea of this Haftoira in connection to Rosh Hashanah, as we said, was primarily her tefillah, her davening in Shiloi. It makes sense to say that the main lesson that we have from the Haftoira in regards to the Avoid of Yida Rosh Hashanah is going to be from tefillah Chana from her davening, especially according to the opinion that's brought in the Shalah that her tefillah was also on Rosh Hashanah. So we're going to understand this by first explaining the story in regards to Tfilas Chana. Originally, Eli HaKoyen considers her to be drunk because the way she was davening, she was whispering, speaking quietly to her heart, so to speak. And therefore, he tells her off and he says, Ad Mosai Tish Takarin, how long are you going to be drunk for, etc. And Chana responds, Lo Yadoini, no, my master, I'm not drunk. I was pouring my soul out in front of Hashem and so on. And the Rebbe asks a number of questions. Seemingly, it's totally not understood. Number one, how is it possible that Eli HaKoyin should make such an extreme mistake instead of recognizing and appreciating that here is a woman that's pouring her heart out, davening to Hashem, he considers her to be drunk. Number two, even if we should find some sort of explanation why Eli made this toes, this mistake, it's still not understood why would the Torah tell us about this. We know the Torah usually won't speak about the shame, about the embarrassment even of a non-kosher animal, especially Lahavdul regarding someone like Eli Akoyan to point out that he made such an error to such a mistake. Number three, if Eli considers her to be drunk, why is Eli waiting till she finishes her davening? As Rashi says on the words of Eli Shoimer Espio, that it, this is an expression of that he was waiting for her to finish, he should immediately interrupt her if she's drunk and make sure that she's taken out of the house of Hashem, out of the Mishkan. All of this tells us that Eli did not consider her to be a drunk in the simple sense of the word. Rather, he looked at her as if she's drunk in the area of davening, drunk of davening. That means to say, since Chana was davening in a way, as the Pasuk describes it here, Bisa, Lehispalo, she was davening in an extra strong way, in an unusual way, much more davening than the regular, Eli thought that this is not appropriate when you're standing in front of Hashem in the house of Hashem. As we'll discuss later a little bit more about that. And Chana's response was, I was pouring my soul out to Hashem. What she's saying is that when my, I'm davening in an extra way, that's not usual, but if it's connected with Shvichas HaNefesh, the outpour of the soul, then it's not considered being drunk in davening, but on the contrary, it's not a negative thing, it's a very high and great thing in the area of davening. Says the Rebbe, this is going to be the connection between Tfilas Chana and Rosh Hashanah. Because this back and forth, this argument claim of Eli and Chana's response regarding the appropriate way how Tfilo needs to be in the house of Hashem is actually going to help us understand a general idea both in regards to Tfilas Chana but also in regards to many of the davenings of Rosh Hashanah as we will soon see. 
The Rebbe explains, in regards to the Tefillahs of Rosh Hashanah, we find what seems to be two opposites. On the one hand, Rosh Hashanah is the Yom Hadin, it's a day of judgment for all the needs of the person, both physical, both spiritually and physically. It says in the Pasuk regarding Rosh Hashanah, which means it's a time of judgment, etc. But it's explained that the word Chaykli Yisrael is from the expression in the Pasuk, lechem chuke, which is referring to food, which means that the person is being judged regarding his food, but it means also all of his physical um, ne- and necessities and so on. And when the Pasuk goes on and speaks about Mishpat Lele Kayakov, this is the judgment regarding all the Ruchni is the things that the person is going to experience, how much Gilu Yalikus he should be able to experience in his Nefesh in the coming year. And this is why we ask in the Tfilis of Rosh Hashanah for all of our needs children, health, Parnosa, also success in our spiritual matters. On the other hand, it's also known that the main point of the Avoida which is accomplished mainly in our davening. The main point of the Avoid of Rosh Hashanah consists of crowning Hashem as our Melech. To use the expression of Chazal, where Hashem says to the Yidin, make me king over you. And as we say this in the davenings of Rosh Hashanah, we ask Hashem, rule Hashem over the whole world with your glory, with your honor. We refer to Hashem as Melech al Kala Aretz, and so on and so forth. What's the idea of crowning a king, accepting his malchus? That's specifically when we stand in a mode of utmost bittel, being completely nullified, where we're completely giving ourselves over to the melech to the extent that we don't even feel any of our own personal desires. And this bittel specifically is actually what brings about by the melech that he should accept our requests to be the king and the fact that we are coronating him, making him king. Says the Rebbe, these two things now seem to be two opposites. If we're standing with such great bittle to the king, this is a time that's completely not possible to be thinking and asking about our own personal needs. The whole, when can we have needs? When can we ask for needs? It's only if we have needs. But if we're standing with such bittle, none of this comes into consideration at all. And this would be true even in regards to spiritual needs. How much more so regarding physical requests? And in fact, the main din of Rosh Hashanah is regarding physical requests, as explained, the Rebbe quotes the Hagois Maiminus. The Rebbe actually says, it says in the Tikkunei Zoyar, that those people that ask B'yoyim Kippuri on these days of atonement, on Yom Kippur, and so on, for Mezoyna, for food, for Slicha V'Kapora, for forgiveness, for Chaya, for life and health, we say Kosveinu L'chaim, Tikkun Zoya says something very, very sharp. These are like clovim, like dogs, that are just saying, have, have, give me, give me, only asking and thinking about themselves, completely self-centered and not thinking about the Shechina. That's on the one hand. But on the other hand, all of these requests for what the person needs is set inside as part of Nusach HaTfila that Chazal have set up from us, for us. And they explained to us that this is actually the Zman Rats in the auspicious time that our requests should be able to be fulfilled, which tells us that these requests, we need to do them not only with Kabbalah soil, only because Hashem told us to ask for our needs on Rosh Hashanah, and therefore we're just doing it because Hashem told us to do it. Clearly, we're doing it in a way where we feel that we need these things and we're asking for them. So the question is, what's going on over here? On the one hand, we're being told, and the way it needs to be is that we need to want to, and we need to have in mind. And that's part of, in, the, in this part of davening, that's what's going on. We're asking that Hashem should give us our needs. And in this case, what's needed is that we do feel our own existence. We feel what we're lacking. And at the same time, we need to be so permeated with this idea of Tamlichuni Aleichem, accepting Hashem as King, which seemingly needs to have full bittel which is negating our own mitzvahs and our own needs. How did these two things go together? Now, before explaining how this works on Rosh Hashanah, the Rebbe says, well, seemingly we could ask the same question regarding the tefillahs of all year round. And the Rebbe is going to explain why it's not the same. But first, the question. When we're davening Shemun we're supposed to be davening like we're standing in front of the king. When we're standing in front of the king, we're not supposed to show any little movement or motion of our own mitzvahs, of our own existence. To the extent that we find in the Gemara, that even if someone makes a little motion in front of the king, there is, Rahman al a punishment, the opposite of life. 
So we need to be standing with absolute bitul, Shwen Ezra, standing in front of the king. At the same time, it was established for every single Yid in the Nusach Atfila, those middle 12 brachas, which is all about asking for our needs. So we could say seemingly it's the same question. We're asking for our needs and there needs to be bitl. But the Rebbe says there's a huge difference between the tefillahs of Rosh Hashanah and all year round. All year round, when it's not the time when we're crowning Hashem as king, it's after the time we crowned Hashem as king, and Hashem is Kavayachal, so to speak, the king already, that's running the country. So in that case, the beetle of the people to the king is in a way that, yes, there is the, their mitzvahs, their existence, there's their needs, the needs of the people, and that's who the king is taking care of. That is the meaning that he's running the country. He's taking care of his people that do have needs. It's only if I'm standing right in front of the king, obviously, what needs to be noticeable is that the whole mitzvah, the whole existence of the country is not something that's independent. Rather, it's all subservient to the king and for the king's desires, etc. But of course, there are still the things the people need. So this is all year round why it's not such a contradiction. Yes, we have our needs, but we're standing with Bittu. But when we're speaking about crowning Hashem as king, which is Rosh Hashanah, in the state when he's completely uplifted, removed, exalted from running the country, here there's a much deeper and greater bittul needed, an absolute bittul, where what's felt is that there's nothing else other than the king himself. So then the question is, how is it that in such a type of situation, we're asking the king, we're asking the Melech of Rosh Hashanah about our own personal needs? Says the Rebbe, the explanation is, when a Yid is asking for what he needs in Rosh Hashanah, what really needs to be the focus, what he's asking for, is not because of his own personal benefit, so that he should have plenty of oilam hazeh, or even plenty of spiritual matters, but rather it's part and parcel and continuation of his avoid of tamlichuni aleichem of making Hashem king. Meaning, in order for Hashem to be able to rule over the whole world with his glory, so that the whole world recognizes, appreciates, and accepts the malchus of Hashem, well, that is, how does that happen? Through a person being involved with this world and making this world a place for Hashem. Now, as we know, every single Yid has godly sparks, holy sparks, which are connected to his neshama specifically that he needs to elevate, he needs to bring them closer to Hashem. They are clothed in all the physical matters that Hashem has set aside, has allotted for his portion, for his avoida. This is what the Yid is asking Hashem, or Rosh Hashanah, to give him his needs. In other words, I want to take these matters of Gashmis, of Olam Haza, and with them to be able to accomplish the Meloi Chal Olam Kuloi, in other words, bringing that part of the world closer to Hashem so that Hashem could rule over it. In other words, what comes out of this is that when a Yid is asking for his needs on Rosh Hashanah, there is no feeling of self involved. He's only asking it for Hashem's sake. On the contrary, this is coming because of his greatest bittle. When he's standing in that avoid of crowning the king, that this is what's bringing out that he should just be focused and interested in what Hashem needs. The Rebbe explains, this idea of birur hanitzoitzis, this idea of elevating the sparks, is connected to the deepest part of our neshama. Why is that? Just like, when Hashem desires to have the Dira B'tachtonim a place in this world, which is accomplished through our Birurim, this is something that's rooted, so to speak, this Nisava, this desire of Hashem, is coming from the deepest part of the essence of Hashem, so too by Yidin that are accomplishing this Avoida, and the intent of this Avoida, this Avoida of Birur and Itzitzis is connected to the deepest part of their Nisham. If we're speaking about an Avoida of that deepest connection between a Yid and Hashem, the Etzim and Hashem, there's no room even for my own personal desires. The Neshama is Chavuko, Dvuka, Bach, Yechido, Liachtoch. It's one with Hashem. It's completely, absolutely connected to Hashem. And therefore, when we're speaking about this level of the Neshama, it's understood that even when he's asking for his, re for his needs in order to fulfill Hashem's Kavana, but it's all connected to the bitul of the Etzim and Neshama, which is revealed by that Avoidu and Tamlichuni Aleichem, you're making Hashem king, you're expressing your greatest bitul. Part of that bitul is that now you're going to want to do things for Hashem, and that's why you're asking for these Gashmi's things to be able to bring them close to Hashem. Now, this all sounds very, very nice and holy and spiritual. So the Rebbe says, seemingly, you could ask when a person is asking for his needs on Rosh Hashanah, Chazal established this Nusach Atfila for each and every Yid, in every type of state that he may be found in. And 
we all know regarding ourselves that the fact that we're asking for physical things and even spiritual things is not only to be able to fulfill Hashem's kavana, but rather it is at least also because we really find ourselves in a certain state of distress, certain problems, and we want that Hashem should fulfill our personal, the person's own needs, and we're asking Hashem to give it to us, from Hashem's open and broad hand. In fact, that's what the mitzvah really is. We know clearly the, what we say in the brachis of davening, and that's what the whole idea of the Chiddush of davening is, that it's about a person that's unwell, should pre- physically become well, that the rain should actually come down. So seemingly, we are very much feeling our own personal needs. Says the Rebbe, if what would be demanded by a tefillah of Rosh Hashanah is just don't think about your needs at all, your gashmi is the needs or any of your needs at all, just focus completely on the fact that you're accepting Hashem as Melech. Just bring out that Kabbalah soil, you're accepting Hashem as Melech, and just don't think about your gashmi is the needs at all. Says the Rebbe, then we wouldn't really have such a question. Because since this is a special time, where the more, the luminary, the source of light, Hashem, is close to the spark to each and every neshama, fine, so it's a time that every person could become this oider, could be aroused, could give himself a real shake inside to become closer to Hashem and just forget about his personal needs and only focus on the ratzoin to be together with the king, Hashem is my melech and so on. The question, however, is how is it possible to, de- possible to demand and from every single yid that he should have both extremes together. On the one hand, think about my own needs and I should be interested in wanting and asking that Hashem should fulfill my needs and at the very same time not to feel in any way any ulterior motives. Rather, it should be completely for Hashem's sake forgetting about m- that it's any- in any way my own personal need. Says the Rebbe, we're going to understand it based on a pirush of the Baal Shem Tev. On a posseh in Tehillim where it says, Re'evim gam tzmeim, people are hungry and thirsty, and then it says, Nafsham bohem tisato. What do these words mean? The Baal Shem Tev translated these words as meaning that the fact that a person, the physical body of a person is hungry and thirsty to certain food and drink is really coming because nafsham bohem tisato, meaning that our nefesh, our soul, wants to elevate the godly sparks, the holy sparks that are in that food and drink. Because the specific sparks in this particular food is connected to this specific person that he needs to fix it, he needs to elevate it. Which means that even though the person, being a physical person, and he only feels his natural hunger to the food because of his goof, but in truth, this hunger is coming from his neshama to those sparks that are in the holy sparks that are in the fo- food that belong to him. Says the Rebbe, the same thing is true here. The fact that a yid is begging on Rosh Hashanah, that Hashem should give him all of his physical and spiritual needs. So even though that externally, it's coming because these things really matter to him. Children, life, health, parnasa. And it, it, it's, it's, it's really negated to his metzias, to himself, and so on. But in truth, the panemius, where is it really coming from? It's really an outpour of the soul, the hunger of the neshama, because the neshama wants to fulfill Hashem's kavana to make these physical things into a place for Hashem. In fact, says the Rebbe, on the contrary, the actual fact that we see, they didn't get so inspired, so aroused, so excited by those words of the San Netoikef, where we speak about Mia Nuach, what's going to happen this coming year, and we call this out in the depths of our heart, and in some ways this is even a bigger isoiterus than we're saying those words, Meloich, crown, uh, rule over the whole world, Bechvaydecho, says the Rebbe, this itself is a proof that that's in truth, in the depths of the Indian, that's really the emiss of what's going on, because it's really coming from so much of a deeper part of our Neshama. Because again, even though the revealed reason is, because since we're in a Shama Baguf, matters of Olam Hazar just happen to be closer and more important to us and touch us deeper than spiritual matters. But the inner reason is because the whole point of what Hashem, the essence of Hashem wants in making this whole world was a dira betachtoinim, as we said. And this is the real reason, the deeper reason of why the Yid is really being touched to the very depths of his soul about these Gash Mizika matters. Says the Rebbe, this is why he's being decided in these requests specifically, because Bepnimius, this is where the Nisham is being shaken to its core, because it wants to be able to fulfill Hashem's Kavana to make the world a dear Allah Yisbarich. Says the Rebbe, now we can understand the reason, Ba'avoida, why we made this Haftoir of Tfilas Chana Rosh Hashanah, 
together with what Eli says, the argument at Moset Tishtakarin, how much longer are you going to be drunk? What was Eli saying? Eli was arguing when you're standing Lufnei Hashem in front of Hashem, in front of the Kodesh HaKadoshim, Eli was arguing something similar to what we were saying before. What should matter to you now? Nothing should concern you, only the fact that you're standing in front of Hashem. There's no room over here to be involved in your requests for physical things. Not even something as important as what Chana was davening for. She wants to have a child. She wants to have a boy. Especially, says Eli, here B'Sala Yisbal, you're davening so much for it. This seems to be a state of drunkenness, even though in good things. But still, bottom line is, you're still thinking about yourself, about your own existence. Your, your desire for what, you're, what, for what you want is so strong that you're not even realizing that you're standing in such a holy place before Hashem. You might have good intentions, but this is such a holy place. That's like being drunk. So this is what Hannah says. I was pouring my soul out to Hashem. Which means, not only was my davening for, for a child not a matter of being drunk, meaning being lost in my own personal desires, just the opposite. My request was coming from an a, a outpour of my panemius and of the essence of my soul, which is specifically connected to this state of standing lifne Hashem. Because I'm standing in front of Hashem, that's what's bringing out my deepest part of my neshama. The Pasuk says, we say this on Lodavad Hashem Oyri, Bakshu Fonai, because as Panecha Hashem Avakish, which Chassidus explains as meaning that it's my deepest part of my soul that's connected to the Panimiyas of Hashem. In other words, this is the place where there is no personal self-desire. The only desire is only what Hashem wants because it's so connected to Hashem. Says the Rebbe, now we can understand why immediately, together with her request, what's she doing? She's promising that if if you give to your maidservant a child, a boy, what am I going to do with the boy? I'm going to dedicate him to Hashem for his whole life. In other words, his whole life should be not about himself, his own personal self, but completely dedicated to Hashem. Because the whole reason she's asking for a child was never for herself, it was only for Hashem's sake. And this is something that touches her and is felt in the deepest part of her nefesh. Says the Rebbe, here we have a hayra in the way to serve Hashem in our tefillah and Rosh Hashanah. It's not enough that our panimius, the panimius of a yid is the way it's supposed to be. The panimius has to come out in a revealed way. And therefore when a yid is standing on Rosh Hashanah and begging and davening to Hashem for his physical needs. Or his spiritual needs. There's always that element inside of us, that Eli Hakoyan in the soul. Which comes and argues and says, "Ad How much are you going to be drunk? Why are you thinking now about any oilam haza, about your own personal needs? Now is the time of achtoras amelach. Just focus on Hashem, and that's it." And nevertheless, we're being told, "No, the yid has to ask for these things." And on the contrary, this itself is really going. This argument of Eli is actually going to bring out the response of Chana, and the same thing by every single yid that even. It, a person that in the meantime is thinking about his own personal needs seemingly just for his own selfish reasons. But Pepinimius, as we said, where is the request really coming from? It's because it's really an outpour of the soul in front of Hashem, which is, as we said, completely one with Hashem, one with the very essence of Hashem. Says the Rebbe, just like in the case of Chana. In the answer, so when, when, what Chana, what, when Chana answered this, this completely removed Eli's argument. And on the contrary, Eli himself agreed with her to the extent where he gives her a bracha and a promise. He says, Yisrael, that Hashem should fulfill your request that you asked of him. So to Hashem, he fulfills the request of each and every yid. For Hashanah toivu musuk in the literal sense, but toiva nirva nigla, but bon nechayu children, health and parnas, and all of them in an abundant way.